Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from him who is and who was and who is to come, a risen and ascended Lord Jesus Christ. My brothers and my sisters in Christ. One person sits there with the square peg in his hand. He's trying to run it through a hole into the box in front of him, and it's not working. Tries one, two, three times, maybe four, and it's still not working. So this person decides, I'm going to try again and again and again. Someone else comes up to this person and says, I think you might want to try a different solution. What you're doing does not seem to work. And this person says, be quiet. I'm working hard on trying to get this square peg through this hole. A different kind of person sits there with the square peg, trying to run it through the hole, tries one, two, three, maybe four times. Someone comes up and says, I think you're trying to run that square peg through the wrong kind of hole. And that person says, oh, you're right. Maybe I should try running the square peg through the square hole and not the round one. And then immediately they have success. This is the difference between someone who has a closed mind and someone who has an open mind, right? Someone with a closed mind can only imagine one solution to the problem that they're trying to solve, and you can't tell them anything they don't already know. You can't tell them anything that will be helpful because they don't need your help. They're just going to keep trying, even if it's so obvious that what they're trying is not working. They're trying to run a square peg through a round hole. A person with an open mind will listen to new perspectives. If you offer some criticism or some advice, they'll listen to you because they're not so closed off that they can't imagine that there's something that they don't have figured out. You have something to offer them. You can teach them. Someone with an open mind is willing to be taught. Today, we ask that Jesus do for us what he did for the disciples, that he open our minds. Because the world now needs open-minded Christians more than ever before. But there's a limit to how helpful being open-minded can be, right? Open-mindedness doesn't necessarily serve you on the highway. We need to have rules of the road that we all agree to. If, if the speed limit or if right-of-way is open to interpretation, people could get killed. In the classroom. If two plus two, if the sum of two and two is kind of open for discussion, learning will not take place without any objective realities, right? So there's a limit to how helpful being open-minded can be. So we ask Jesus today, open our minds in the right way, in the way that helps the most. Because the disciples' world has just been rocked, hasn't it? Think of everything that they had been going through over the last few weeks. They had watched Jesus, their favorite person in the entire world, die. He was brutally murdered and mistreated right before their very eyes. Their world was over, or at least they thought. Then something almost even worse happened because after Jesus was placed in the tomb of that, that was owned by Joseph of Arimathea, <clears throat> they learned, <clears throat> excuse me, that the tomb is empty, that Jesus' body is gone. What horror, what terror. But then something even wilder happens because Jesus is back, back from the dead. They thought they had seen a ghost, but they didn't see a ghost because Jesus was back physically. They could shake his hand, they could give him a hug, they could touch his scars and his hands and his side. And what is more, Jesus ate in front of them before their very eyes. I don't really like it when people can watch me eat, especially when it's a messy meal like tacos or spaghetti. Please don't look at me while I'm eating spaghetti. But Jesus was eating a meal right there, and what did that show them? It showed him he was back, back in the flesh. Jesus had literally been to hell and back again. And because he could eat food, they knew for certain that the same body they saw hanging on that cross was the body sitting in front of them right now. What an amazing thing to be a witness to. You can imagine that a couple of those disciples wanted this moment to last forever. They wanted Jesus to stay with them, keep on teaching them, keep on being their rabbi, their teacher, their Jesus. But 
Jesus' work was not done. Do you realize that? That Jesus' work is not done? Are we living with that kind of mindset? I think it's hard, don't you think? Jesus has a timeline in mind, and maybe our timeline is something like this. We know that Jesus existed through all eternity. He is true, true God, after all. He was born true man on that first Christmas. He lived a human life on planet Earth, and then he suffered, he died, and was buried on the third day. He rose again from the dead. And as we read in both Acts and Luke this morning, Jesus ascended into heaven where he is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. So you have brackets, don't you? Jesus' life here on earth, his suffering, his death, even his resurrection, then his ascension. And we know that somewhere in the future, some time that we don't know about, Jesus is going to come back and judge the living and the dead, like we say in the creed. But what about right now? Is Jesus taking a break? Dying and rising is pretty hard work. I think Jesus earned a break. Is Jesus on hiatus until he comes back and judges? Jesus wants us to see this morning through this lesson in Luke, brothers and sisters, how dangerous it actually is to think that Jesus is taking a break. How dangerous, how many consequences there are to us and to our safety, to our sanity, to our faith if we think that Jesus is taking a little breather. But that's how it feels, doesn't it? That's what we're tempted to think, isn't it? But if Jesus is gone, if Jesus is done with his hard work, then how do we make sense of something like what happened last week to those kids? If Jesus is gone, how do you make sense? How do you cope with your guilt? Because you know you're a sinner. I know I am. If Jesus is gone, if he's taking a break, then how do we make it? If Jesus is just our Savior who died on a cross at one time, and maybe he's going to come back in the future, but at least for now, we don't know what he's doing, right? Brothers and sisters, please see the urgency Jesus has, the very firm timeline Jesus has in his head in, this, in today's gospel, and see that Jesus is still at this very moment very, very busy. Because what does he say to his disciples? This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the, in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. The law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. In other words, the entire Old Testament, Jesus is saying. He's saying to his disciples, don't think too hard about what's happening right now. Don't think too hard about why I died and why I rose. It has been on the pages of your Hebrew Bible for you to read your entire lives. It makes sense. This is what has been, it's all been moving towards. But he mentions the prophets. How often in your personal Bible reading do you open up to the prophets? If you're like me, not very often. The prophets are scary. The prophets are complicated. So what do you find on the pages of the prophets of the Old Testament? You find statements of God's wrath against sin. You find descriptions of how Israel is screwing up. You find all this stuff, the, the statements of judgment, prophecies of judgment against people. It's kind of intimidating to read for the average Christian, I'll grant you that. That's why in our Sunday morning Bible classes we've started a series on looking at the prophets and, and studying them in a little bit more detail. But what else you find in the prophets is you find these statements, these predictions of what the Messiah is going to be, of what the Christ is going to do. We call them messianic prophecies. Jesus is saying, every single one of those I have fulfilled. I have fulfilled everything every prophet had said that I am going to do. But you find something else. If you take the time to really look at what those prophets have to say, if you take the time to really digest what the prophets say about how wicked this world is, about how much evil there is out there, evil there is in here, and God's wrath against sin, and what we all deserve because of our sin, what you are seeing is a description 
of the very problems Jesus came to solve, aren't you? Because what are your greatest problems? Who are your greatest enemies? It's not a group. It's not a political party. It's not even a single person who decides to act terribly wickedly and harm a bunch of people. Your greatest enemy is sin itself, is the devil himself, is death itself. And who did Jesus come to defeat? All three in one fell swoop. As Jesus was nailed to the cross and shed his blood, those drops of blood were like, were like coins bouncing in the coffer, paying God the redemption price for your freedom from sin. As Jesus was laid in that tomb, in death, he was suffering the death that you and I deserve, suffering in our place. And as Jesus rose with his own body from that grave, he guarantees your resurrection, your victory over death. So your sins are forgiven. The devil is defeated. Death itself cannot claim you because Jesus came to do everything that the prophets, the Psalms, and the law of Moses said he would. May God open our minds to understand that. And he has, hasn't he? Through his word. He goes on. He opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures and he told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I'm going to send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. If a tree falls in the middle of the forest and no one is around to hear it, does it make a sound? Of course it does. Stuff makes noise even if you're not there to hear it, right? Can we agree on that? If Jesus comes and dies on a cross to forgive the sins of all mankind of all time and no one hears about it and no one is brought to faith because of that message, is anyone saved? What a horrible thought, right? What a terrible question. I'm even sorry for asking it, but don't worry. Jesus thought of this ahead of time. Why did Jesus have a group of 12 guys plus a bunch of other people follow him around at every station of his life? Why did Jesus make sure that there were those people who saw him go to the cross and experience that trauma of seeing him die? Why did Jesus come back from the dead in a way that people could see with their eyes? Why did Jesus appear to them? Why did Jesus eat in front of them? So that they could tell people the simple message of what they saw. It's as easy for them as sharing the very things they laid their own eyes on. And through that message, Jesus was going to open hearts, open minds, preach forgiveness, reach people, and save thousands, millions, billions of human souls, including yours. What did Jesus call the message that he had to preach. He called it the message of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. What's repentance? If you have any experience in the church, you probably think of repentance as saying you're sorry to God. And that makes sense. That's the basic definition of repentance, saying you're sorry to God. But what has to happen to your heart and to your mind in order for you to say sorry? When I say sorry to my wife for something that I've done, I've had to undergo a little change before I'm ready to say that. When I say sorry, I'm saying, there was a time when I thought whatever I did was a good idea, but I'm past that time now, and I realize that that was a huge mistake. I'm sorry, can you forgive me? When you repent to God, a change has taken place in your heart and in your mind. Because you say to God, God, I can see now. I've been trying so hard to be righteous on my own, and I can't. I keep failing. 
God, I can see now that although I thought my sin was excusable and not a big deal, I see now that it is a big deal, that my sin causes my death, and that my only hope is in you, Lord. My only hope for forgiveness and salvation is in your name, and I know I don't deserve it, God, but please will you forgive me. That's repentance. Do you see how your mind has to change? Your mind has to be opened. You don't do this to yourself. God does it for you. He opens your mind through his Holy Spirit, through his gift. But he doesn't just make you sorry. He doesn't just bring you to your knees and cause you to beg him for forgiveness, but he shows you in that moment how full and free your forgiveness is. Because you admit to God that you have no hope for salvation, and God says, I know, but I am your hope. I am your salvation. Just trust in me, that's it. And you're safe. That's the message the disciples are meant to share. That's the message you and I are meant to share. It's as simple as sharing what we ourselves have seen with our own eyes. Because the world now needs open-minded Christians more than ever before. Suffering and sin and wickedness have always been in the world, but just the older that you get, the more of it you see, right? the more of it you experience. The longer you're alive, the more mistakes you make, the more you realize how humble you need to be before the cross, but how much you need Jesus. The world needs open-minded Christians, but open-minded in the right way. The world doesn't need more Christians who demand that people act, think, talk, and be exactly like us before they can walk through those doors. The world doesn't need that kind of Christian because that's not Christ. Nor does the world need Christians who are so open-minded that all roads lead to heaven, and as long as you're being sincere on your walk of, walk of life, that that's all we really care about and that you'll get to heaven. No, Jesus is very clear. There's only one repentance for the forgiveness of sins because there's only one Savior from our sins. But the world needs Christians with open ears, ears that are willing to listen to the experiences of someone else, experiences and sufferings that I may have no clue what it feels like to be in that position. Open minds enough to accept that someone else is living on planet Earth too and their interpretation of events and things and perspectives might be different than mine. And that might be okay. An open mind, open enough to not sit someone down and lecture them about how they need to trust in Jesus as their Savior, but listening to what they're saying and presenting Jesus in a way that they can hear, showing what we have been shown, that Jesus is our hope and salvation, our forgiveness, showing that to someone else. That's what the world needs. The world needs Christians who are willing to crucify on the cross all of our excuses that keep us from sharing our experiences in Christ. Like, I don't have the time I've got my own thing. I don't know enough about the Bible. I'm too new of a Christian. Or evangelism and sharing your faith is for someone else. Or I need more training or anything like that. Because now is the time, brothers and sisters. There is not going to be a better time to tell someone what Jesus has done for you and what Jesus has done for them. But don't forget, Jesus is not done. Jesus is not gone. He is using his word to open hearts and minds. Jesus is very, very busy. That's why he ends our lesson the way that he does. What was the last thing the disciples saw before Jesus ascended into heaven? After everything he told them they had to do, as afraid as they probably were from the way people were going to react to them as they share this forgiveness of sins. They were going to turn around and say, the guy that you saw die on a cross, he's actually God, he's your Savior. They were scared about how people would respond. What was the last thing Jesus left them with after giving them their marching orders? This. He lifted his hands, he blessed them, and he went up into heaven a physical way that we mimic every single service. What Jesus did for those disciples with this gesture, as simple as it is, was showing them, 
Surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. There is not a place that you go that I don't go with you. There is not a place that you go where my love doesn't go with you. There is not a place where you go where I have not already been, that I don't forgive you, that I don't show that I am your Lord. I am with you to the very end of the age because it's my word you're preaching. It's my word you're sharing. It's my forgiveness you are sharing with others, with the people that I love just like I love you. That was his parting thought as he ascended into heaven, where he's not gone. He's still very, very busy. And so we can be busy too doing the work Jesus has given us to do. Amen.